you know, that you have to have, you know, as a leader, uh, a frontline focus um, on your most valuable employees that I believe are at the front line, you know, at the front line level. Those are the folks that are dealing with customers every day, most likely the front line to customers, I should say, or dealing with things that, you know, the customer kind of really depends on. It's kind of like the last mile, if you will, or the beginning. Welcome to Growing Your Business with People. This podcast is dedicated to helping business leaders maximize their business growth through optimized people leadership. Join us as we explore strategies, insights, and stories that empower you to unleash your true potential of your organization by growing your most valuable investment, your people. Today we have on the show Dennis Berger, who has a storied career as an HR executive in organizations. He has over 12 years at Pepsi, over 13 years as CHRO at at CDW, and most recently as CHRO of AutoNation in Suffolk. Dennis also serves as the committee chair for Skills for America's Future and sits on our board at Skills for Rhode Island's Future. Welcome to the program, Dennis. Hey, good morning, Jeff. Thank you. I'm uh, excited to be here. Well, we're excited to have you. Today, we're going to focus on frontline leadership, and we're going to talk to you about what it takes to be a frontline leader and what can make a difference in the in the hearts and the minds of those people who are actually doing your everyday work and honestly facing off to most to your customers. But before we get into frontline leadership, tell us a little bit about yourself, your career and how you learned how to engage uh, as a frontline leader yourself. Absolutely, Jeff. I appreciate it. So, so I've been in HR for now about 34 years, and about half those years spent, uh, fortunately, as a uh, you know as a CHRO, as you mentioned, at CDW Automation, and, and most recently uh, Suffolk. You know where I really learned about the front line. I started my career actually as a first level supervisor uh, at a trucking company, and I had about 50 to 75 teamsters. As time goes on, I forget how many, but they're a lot. These were folks that were typically you know twice my age. I think I was 24, 25 at the time. And uh, and you learn a lot about when you have that many folks reporting into you on an hourly basis that are hourly employees, union represented, by the way, you learn really, really quickly that you need them more than they need you. <laughs> um, and uh, and I was in that role for uh, for a few months and then moved into an HR role with uh, with GTE uh, on the labor side, employee relations side and labor, labor relations. So kind of you know, that experience that I had at the trucking company um, leading Teamsters really helped me from an HR perspective, especially in that first role. So I think it's there, Jeff, is where um, I really get a, you know, get a firsthand experience of, you know, that you have to have, you know, as a leader, um, a frontline focus um, on your most valuable employees that I believe are at the front line, you know, at the front line level. Those are the folks that are dealing with customers every day, most likely the front line to customers, I should say, or dealing with things that, you know, the customer kind of really depends on. It's kind of like the last mile, if you will, or the beginning, um, you know, the, the first mile, depending on kind of what your organization does, where uh, where your frontline folks may come into play. So, and then the, the final thing that I'll say, um, you know, throughout my career, I've been blessed and fortunate to work with some terrific leaders that um, have taken the time to give me, you know, um, uh, first of all, kind of lead by example, but then secondly, give, um, you know, provide feedback. And and it wasn't always feedback that, uh, you know, that you enjoyed hearing, but it was, and usually that's usually the best feedback that you can get. And um, and I think that's, uh, that really, really helped me um, as a leader. So, uh uh, so that's a little bit about my, you know, about my story and my um, uh, passion for um, kind of leadership, especially at the frontline level. What do they say? Often some of your toughest coaches are actually some of your best coaches. So, uh, so you know, obviously giving tough feedback is a critical, uh, critical feat, uh, feature of this. But one of the things that we want to talk today is really about that frontline leader, right? And how do you, uh, how do you go about uh, and one of the things that I've heard you say a number of times is that any leader knows that picking winning teams is absolutely critical to business success. And I've heard you often say that most of us were actually better at picking winning teams when we were 10 years old than we are now. 
What recommendations would you have for leaders on how to pick winning teams? Yeah, you know, here, and I'll tell you the story in a second and what, you know, what I mean by kind of, I think we knew more when we were 10 to 12 years old about picking winning teams that we do today when it really matters. But, you know, I call this kind of don't defer your pick. You know, as a leader, one of the most important decisions you can make is who's going to be on your team, right? And I've seen a lot of times throughout my career where leaders kind of defer their pick. They rely on somebody else. Well, just fill my team. Again, especially frontline leaders where you may have, again, you know, 20, 30, 40 people reporting into you. I've seen in the past um, at various companies where the leader says they have so much kind of hitting them, which I kind of understand, but they'll go to their HR person or their recruiting person, talent acquisition, whatever, and say, hey, just go find me somebody. And, uh, you know, I've heard the, the saying, you know, I'd rather have somebody with bad breath than no breath, you know, type of thing. And, and so I've seen that. Um, I've talked to folks that have been under that kind of that pressure. And what I've tried to tell them is that don't defer your pick. That's the worst thing that you could possibly do. And, and I would relate it back. I, I, I would tell folks when they would say that to me, I, I would say, hey, you know what? It's interesting. Uh, you knew more about picking a winning team when you're 10, 12 years old than you do today. And today it really matters, right? It, it matters for your livelihood, your career, the livelihood of your team members, the careers of your team members. You know, who's on that team really, really matters. Back when you're 10, 12 years old, you basically did it for bragging rights, right? You wanted to win, um, you know, and, uh, and stuff. That the, the, There weren't really any kind of negative consequences, um, you know, if you will, in terms of your, you know, decision making and picking your team members. But regardless, even though there were no negative consequences, you wanted to win and you wanted to pick the best team. So I get this story, you know, again, thinking back 10, 12 years old, you're on the playground or after school or whatever, and uh, you're going to play kickball, baseball, softball, pick a sport and basketball. And I would say, OK, what's the first thing when everybody gets onto the playground? Uh, what's the first thing that um, that has to be decided? Right. What's the first thing kind of people you know, kids uh, would kind of argue over. And um, inevitably, some of you would say, well, who's going to be captain? And I'd say, exactly. The very first thing is, who's going to be captain? And, you know, you'll usually have four or five folks say, hey, I want to be captain, I want to be captain, and then you settle on two people. Now, you sit there and say, well, you, you know, why do they want to be captain? They're 10, 12 years old. It wasn't, again, it wasn't a pride or an ego thing back then. They wanted to be captain because they wanted to have control. They wanted to be able to, they wanted to win. They wanted to pick their team. They wanted to have that opportunity that, hey, if I'm going to play, I want to make sure I'm picking the people. I want to win. I'm going to pick the people on my team. The next thing, right? So once captains are selected, I would say, okay, now what's the next decision they have to make? And of course, somebody would say, well, who has first pick? And if you remember, that was the real battle that would be good is who would, you know, begin, that who would have first pick. And again, first pick was about, you know, again, I want to win. I want to be the best person. So the captain, at least from my own experience, the majority, the vast majority of the time, the captains weren't picking whoever got first pick. You weren't picking your best friend. You were picking the person that you felt was the best player, right, that could really help you win and help, you know, your entire team be successful. Your best friend, by the way, could have been the last pick. And if you think about it, you know, it was a pretty honest system, right? You got to have first pick, da, 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 and then at the end, it's like, you know, there's one person standing and say, ah, Dennis, I guess you're, you know, you're on my team, Dennis, you know, type of thing. So although I may have been the best friend of one of the captains, I could have been very easily the last pick because, you know, I wasn't very good at that particular, you know, um, you know, uh, game that we were playing, sport that we were playing. So, you know, when you put it in that context, Jeff, I think that's when, what I, again, what I've experienced firsthand is I think that's where, you know, leaders, especially frontline leaders, sit there and say, holy cow, you're right. You know, they reflect back to, you know, to those times and say, gosh, it didn't matter back then. But I put a lot more, you know, I knew a lot more about, you know, wanting to win and wanting to pick the right team. And and I've had leaders tell me after that story years later, I every time I go to pick my team or I have an opening, I think of that analogy. I think of that story. And so, you know, um, so that's that's. The, the, the point that I want to make here, is, especially as a frontline leader, when you have, you know, multiples of people reporting into you, I know it can be easy to do because you have so much kind of going on, so much is expecting you. I, I've always believed that I learned this at Pepsi. Um, you know, the frontline leadership is the toughest job, you know, that's out there within the company. The leaders used to say that all the time, and I truly believe that. But don't defer your pick. At the end of the day, it just it just hurts you and it hurts your uh, it hurts your team and and um, and your fellow team members. 
Wow, that's some powerful words there. One of the things that really strikes me is the fact that our frontline leaders are inundated with so many responsibilities and there's so many things on their plate. Prioritizing that pick, not deferring the pick and prioritizing taking time to make that pick and make the right pick and to understand and balance uh, you know, what is the talent in front of them how does how is the makeup of their team? What is it going to look like so that you you're not filled with a bunch of pitchers, right? You don't want to have a, a baseball team all of pitchers because you, you your batting average might be a little bit bad, right? Uh, not saying anything about pitchers, not trying to you know uh, say anything about them, but you know you might need uh, a well-rounded team. This podcast is brought to you by 7-Step, a leading global workforce solutions provider that offers recruitment process outsourcing, MSP services to manage the flexible workforce, including suppliers and contractors, and total talent solutions for managing the entire permanent and flexible workforce supply. Their people are great, and so is their technology, particularly their Surveo Insights data and intelligence platform. It's really cutting edge, not only in how it brings your talent data together, but in how it draws deep, detailed, predictive intelligence. It's really like a crystal ball for your talent data. I used 7-Step at my previous two organizations, and their team helped us to launch a full-service RPO to staff healthcare workers, customer service reps, IT professionals, data science and engineering, digital design teams, along with aerospace engineers and manufacturing workers. Their talent analytics put data at my fingertips, which allowed me to see around corners and strategically plan for frequent and volatile market changes, including a global pandemic where we had to hire literally hundreds of thousands of people. Their deep knowledge and exceptional integrity allowed me to rely on them as a trusted partner across multiple lines of business. Go to 7stepRPO.com to learn more about the powerful things 7-Step can do for you. What if you could have an up-to-the-minute dashboard that showed you exactly how to improve candidate experience from first career site visit to fully onboarded new hire? With Surveil, you can. This podcast is brought to you by Surveil's Candidate Experience Management Platform. In my role at CVS, I used Surveil and it showed my team unprecedented insights into how our people, processes, and technology were positively and negatively affecting candidate experience. It gave us a roadmap for delighting candidates, boosting employer brand, and improving hiring outcomes. Visit Surveil.com today for more information. And while you're there, download our free white paper, The Data-Driven Candidate Experience Maturity Model. Check out top HR product winner Surveil and download your free white paper at surveil.com. As a CEO or as a CHRO, how do you encourage your uh, your your frontline leaders to prioritize? And what are the things that you that you say, hey, listen, as, as you're prioritizing this. You know, you may need to deprioritize. How do you how do you uh, how do you ask them, and how do you encourage them to uh, to put this at the very top of their list? Yeah, it's a it's a great question, Jeff. Because to your point, right, they're getting they're getting hit with a million things during the day. Uh, you know, I, I think number one, it's it all begins with people, right? We can't be successful, and that's the the, the genesis and the point of your podcast. We can't be successful without having the right, you know, without having people and, of course, having the right people like we just kind of talked about. And so there's a little bit in terms of prioritization that, hey, we we need to fight the battle with a full crew. Um, You know, we can't just kind of, you know, wake up every day and and face that what we have in front of us, um, you know, without being fully staffed and without having the right people. Uh, to go into battle with, right? Every because sometimes it can be a battle, right? Depending on what you're what you're focused on. So I think it's being as a as a leader, as a senior leader, and I've seen this with the CEOs that I've worked for in the past. They are relentless 
you know, and making sure that, you know what, that we're doing our best to get the right people, you know, on the bus, right? Um, it is all about, you know, finding, making sure that we're taking the time, we're finding the right people, we're developing, you know, those team members, um, you know, et cetera. So it is a, I guess how I would answer that is it's a, a relentless kind of drumbeat. And I think the time, you know, whenever you take your focus off of it or you take your foot off the pedal, and you don't talk about it, I think that's when things kind of suffer, right? Well, geez, Dennis or, you know, so-and-so, our CEO is no longer talking about the importance of, you know, making sure that we have the right people, blah, 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 it must not be important anymore, right? And, and that's just kind of a, a small example. The other things I would tell you in terms of, you know, prioritizing, I think you hit on something there. Um, you, you know, it's, it's everybody brings something different to the table, right? When you look at, when you talk to candidates, et cetera, I think there are some kind of core things that you always want to look at, right? You want to look at their values. Um, you know, number one, you want to kind of test that, you know, kind of what are they made of when the times get tough? I think the other thing is, um, you, know, you know, you hear people talk about culture fit. Uh, it, that's, that's a phrase that I think over the last, you know, three, four years, I've kind of really kind of Kind of learn some things, you know, about you know about culture. Some of you know, we all know all the really good things about culture. There's some kind of things within cultures that have kind of inhibited um, organizations from being kind of their truly their best. I, I rather look at it as rather than looking for a culture fit, right? And fit means to conform um, by definition. You look for values match. Um, you know, go out there and you know, and values obviously feeds into culture. So start with your values. Look for somebody who matches your values, not necessarily somebody that's going to fit, you know, fit your culture because they may fit a piece of the culture that may not be the best, best part of your culture, if you know what I mean. So that and then the second thing I would say, Jeff, is everybody plays a role on a team, right? No different. Again, you know, any team that we've ever been on, um, sports teams, academic teams, you know, et cetera. Um, there's always somebody that's good at something, right? Or there's always somebody that compliments somebody else. And I think, you know, as a leader, especially at the front line, I, I think you got to learn pretty quickly, okay, you know, as I pick my team, who are those that, how can I look for, you know, uh, from, a role, from a role standpoint, folks that are going to compliment something or add to the team, you know, that, that sort of thing. Don't just kind of Kind of keep keep picking the kind of the the folks that kind of bring the same thing uh, to the team. So I would really say those two things: values. Start with your values. Look for a values match, and then kind of look at um, from a role standpoint. Um, you know, folks that are really gonna you know um, gonna be a value add. You know, with um, if you will, or complement. Um, you know, areas where um, you know you may need the help. That's terrific advice, Dennis. One of the things that I used to always say, and, I, and this completely dovetails with what you just said, I said, uh, always look for people who can who reflect your values and resonate with your purpose. If you can establish that, then you can get onto the other deeper levels of selection to decide whether or not they're going to be actually a fit for the role and a longer term fit for your organization. But that establishes the common ground that says, yeah, this person could be a very good uh, asset within our organization. One of the things that I also tell folks is, and, and this is going right back to what you're saying, is, is that you know the the role of bias in selection is a big deal, right? And and we need to find ways to be able to get at the things that are relevant to the fit. And it's not some uh, black box, uh, you know, AI technology that's going to tell us, oh, this person's good and that person's bad. I, I I tell people, I said, be careful of that. That's that's not really helpful. What I would say is look at a very structured behavioral based interview that is based upon the actual job itself. And scientifically, I've studied this myself. I've been uh, you know in in grad school, et cetera. You can see between a five to seven hundred percent increase in validity. The, pro the likelihood that you're going to pick, to your point, that best player by doing a, a structured behavioral based interview. Now, what does that actually mean if you're an executive or CEO? That means that work with your HR department, look at the uh, look at the actual competencies of the role as itself, and they probably already have questions lined up. And all that you do is make sure that the people who are aligned with the competencies that they're interrogating against, that they that they ask the same questions of the same people, and then they capture that information and notes so that you can evaluate them 
and and free yourself of some of the bias that is inherent in a selection process. And it also, if you re- if you reduce the bias, then you improve the likelihood that you're going to find somebody that is a winning uh, a winning member of your team. And that is a I think that's a huge asset. So thank you for bringing that up. Uh, you know that the concept of you know a values match as opposed to a cultural fit. That's a really good comment. Hello listeners, as a senior business leader, you're probably struggling with scaling infrastructure like succession, engagement of people, retention, hiring, and even change management. FutureSolve is an HR advisory firm founded with some of the most well-known CHROs in the country. We specialize in helping medium-sized companies and small businesses with their HR strategy. We do this using a blended service of strategy and innovative AI technologies to make an impact on the bottom line. This podcast is brought to you by Paradox AI, also known as Olivia, recruiting's most advanced AI assistant. I used Paradox at my previous organization, and their team helped us create a candidate concierge experience that ensured a fast hiring process that still felt very human. We literally hired hundreds of thousands of people, many of whom were critical healthcare workers needed during the pandemic. She would let them know we had an interview or offer waiting and would help them navigate onboarding processes. Olivia made the experience easy and fast, two essential ingredients in recruiting great people. It's not just me. Organizations like McDonald's, General Motors, Unilever, and L'Oreal use this technology to create engaging and fast candidate experiences. Go to Paradox.ai to learn more about the amazing things Paradox and Olivia can do for you. As we pivot here, um, you know, one of the things that, uh, you know, that we think about uh, in terms of, uh, you know, an organization is, you know, is the fact that we are growing our business with, with people, right? As leaders, as business leaders, CEOs. So Dennis, what are, uh, you know, maybe a, a couple things, one or two things that you would recommend to our listeners, CEOs and business leaders, as something that they could actually do tomorrow that would help grow their business with people? Yeah, I, th- that's an easy one. And I think it's, um, again, sticking almost like with the frontline focus, but with any team, whether you're frontline, you know, uh, employees or you're managing, you're leading kind of other leaders, professionals, whatever, you know, recognition goes a long way. And, and recognition can be as simple as hello in the morning and thank you in the evening. And, and I think, you know, we're all amazed if we really think about it and even ourselves as leaders, you know, how many times have we, as you know, in the, in the morning that if team members have come into the office you know, you're busy or you may walk by their office or their cube or walk by them on the floor, um, you know, warehouse floor or whatever, and, and not even acknowledge them, right? By just saying hello, right? Or excuse me, you know, hello, right? It's the morning. Good morning. Hello. You know, how are you? Thank I'm glad you're here, you know, et cetera. And, and again, I've been guilty of it, you know, guilty of it myself. But, you know, that's recognition. Just simply acknowledging the fact in the morning that, somebody's actually there you never know what they would have went through just to get this especially frontline right frontline where they're typically hourly employees they have a specific start time yes as professionals we have a little bit more latitude um that stuff we can be a little bit late you know about uh, you know that type of thing white frontline employees specifically hourly employees don't have that and so you never know what they would have went through just to get the office you know i think about my own experiences right you know you wake up in the morning and you're arguing with your kids over homework. You're trying to get them out the door. You know, uh, you you know, you the, the, may have car problems, flat tire, traffic, whatever. And you know, you got this stress of, hey, I got to get to the office. You know, I got to get to the office. I got to get to the warehouse. Or I got to get to the manufacturing site. You know, etc. And so, you know, recognize that, hey, just just recognize that you know the fact that somebody's there in the morning. Say hello. Say good morning. Because again, you never know what they would have went through. Conversely, the same thing goes, you know, in the evening. Um, the recognition extends at the end of the day. Just say, you know, thank you, you know, at the end of the day. And again, you know, as I've done it before. You're walking by and you just, you know, you don't say anything. You don't say have a good evening or anything like that. I'll see you tomorrow. You can be as simple as thank you. Thank you for everything that you did today, um, which, you know, ultimately kind of, you know, helps me, helps the team, you know, et cetera. So, 
One thing, Jeff, very quickly that is actionable is just hello in the morning and thank you in, in the evening, you know, as a leader. If you just do those two things, recognition is simple, is as simple as that. I would say the other thing, and I and I kind of touched upon this just in the story I just gave, is that, you know, make sure, you know, we always hear a lot about, hey, we got to make sure that we see things through the eyes of our customers, right? I think you'll hear CEOs talk about that all the time, right? We've got to be customer centric, see things through the eyes of our customers. You know, as HR, as any leader, especially HR leaders, I think we, we we should take that and say, hey, let's make sure that we're seeing things through the eyes of our coworkers, through the eyes of our employees, the eyes of our associates, right? And and I think we all would agree, oh, yeah, sure, we do that. But, you know, do we really do it to the extent um, um, and to the degree, extent, degree and level that we should, right? Are we really thinking about, you know, how is this decision going to impact or, you know, um, how is this performance going to impact, et cetera? Let's make sure the same time that when we say, hey, let's make sure we look through things through the eyes of our customers, we should always say, OK, then let's make sure at the same time, let's look at things through the eyes of our coworkers and, uh, and our employees and, and make sure that we're putting that same level of focus. Because at the end of the day, I think we all know this, right? I mean, um, uh, you know, the founder at, at CDW had a great saying, right? Happy coworkers make happy customers. Um, I know James Hathskett, you know, has done a lot of work in this area as HBS professors written a number of books, right? Um, there's a direct correlation between the engagement, and we know this, right, the, all the studies between engagement, happiness, whatever word you want to use of your employees and, um, and customers. So that's the final thing I would say. Make sure we see things through the eyes of our, we pay attention to see things through the eyes of our, uh, our employees. Oh, that's wonderful. That's actually a running theme in this show. We, we, uh, I, I often say if you have your, your colleague or your coworkers back, then they can have your customers back. Right? Exactly. And, mm -hmm. So I love the happy coworkers, happy customers. Uh, you know, that's a, that's a very simple way of saying it. So, uh, well, thank you, Dennis. Uh, wow. Some really powerful stuff here. The first, uh, the first thing that I, I heard you talk about is don't defer your pick, you know, knowing that as a leader, you have the opportunity to pick your team and that team should not be delegated or relegated. That picking of the team shouldn't be relegated to anybody else, but, uh, but yourself put that back on your shoulders. Uh, the second that I heard was, uh, is really, as you're picking the best, use a values match approach and uh, and help pick the best. Uh, you know, using that approach as well as uh, we talked a little bit about debiasing the interview and selection process so that you actually know who the best is that's going to be on your team. So that is uh, that is really a uh, big deal. I also heard uh, you talk about. Uh, a very simple and very actionable way for leaders to to uh, you know to just give recognition by saying hello in the morning and thank you in the evening. How powerful is that, right? And so easy to do, but it's so easy to forget about. As leaders, we may forget about the fact that that there's people all around us that are looking to us, and that little hello or that little thank you at the end of the day. That show of gratitude may mean the world to them after a very, very hard day. Uh, and then lastly, I really love this, the close. You said uh, you talked about happy coworkers equals happy customers. And there's no better quote than that to finish up this podcast. So thank you so much, Dennis, for being a part of our show today. Well, thank you, Jeff. I really enjoyed it and I appreciate it. And uh, you're doing great work. So keep up the uh, keep up the podcast. Well, that's another amazing episode of Growing Your Business with People with our special guest, Dennis Berger. For those watching or listening, please like, subscribe, and most importantly, comment. Your feedback will be used in the upcoming podcasts.